welcome to uh, the University of South Australia and to the Hawke Centre. My name is Nigel Rolfe, I'm Deputy Vice-Chancellor here at the University and it's my pleasure to introduce this event today. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we are holding this event on the traditional land of the Kaurna people and pay respect to their traditional relationship with uh, the land. It gives me huge pleasure to welcome you here tonight uh, on behalf of the Hawke Centre and the University of South Australia to hear from Maggie Beer, a great friend of the, the University, and Professor Ralph Martins, who have teamed up over this fantastic book that you've seen outside, in which they'll be signing at the end of the, uh, the event, uh, aimed at fighting one of the most debilitating diseases of our time. And the Hawke Centre is very pleased to be co-presenting this event with Matilda Bookshop, and I'd like to thank uh, Gavin Williams for his support in organising the event. We also thank the publishers, Simon and Schuster Australia, for their work in bringing, in fact, many authors here to, uh, to the Hawke Centre. Uh, the Hawke Centre, to say a word about that, is uh, an organisation named, obviously, after uh, uh, Bob Hawke, former Prime Minister, committed to delivering a diverse programme of events and exhibitions through the year, uh, reflecting our fundamental themes of strengthening our democracy, valuing our diversity and building our future. And I think the event tonight very firmly sits in that building our, our future box. Uh, just to say the session tonight is being recorded. Um, and will be available to view on the Hawke Centre website very shortly. Uh, and we encourage you to bring this to the attention of friends and colleagues who couldn't attend this evening. As we are recording, if you wouldn't mind to, um, switching your phones to, to silent to avoid interruptions, that would be much appreciated. Um, but don't turn them off because we'd like you to join the Twitter conversation uh, using the link shown on the screen behind me. Said so he not turning around, hoping there are. Oh, they are there. Good. Excellent. Uh, Maggie and Ralph will be taking questions following the presentation and, as I said before, will be signing books at the, uh, the end of the event in the foyer. And I would like to mention that the proceeds of the book sales are going uh, to both the Maggie Beer Foundation and, um, and to the Alzheimer Research Foundation. So just to introduce our speakers tonight, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Julia Lester for agreeing to participate in this uh, in conversation. Julia, who uh, needs no introduction really, has worked uh, for many years as uh, a broadcaster and producer, current affairs reporter, public speaker, MC of events, interviewer, news journalist, teacher, actor and musician. Tonight she will speak with our invited guests, Maggie Beer and Professor Ralph Martins. Maggie, of course, somebody else who really requires no uh, introduction, is celebrated for her entrepreneurial skills, natural leadership uh, abilities in the gourmet food area. Her fame has been built on a career that spans farming, food production, exporting, food writing, and television presenting. Maggie is uh, an honorary doctor of the University of South Australia, I'm very proud to say, in recognition of her huge contribution to the promotion of South Australia's food and tourism industries and her contribution to well-being in the community. Professor Ralph Martins is Professor of Neurobiology at Macquarie University and Foundation Chair in Aging and Alzheimer's Disease at Edith Cowan University. He first became interested in Alzheimer's research when his father-in-law was diagnosed with the illness and has continued working towards diagnosing, preventing and effectively treating Alzheimer's since then. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Maggie Beer, Ralph Martins and Julia Lester. Thank you, and uh, my thanks again, once again, for the Hawke Centre and the wonderful work that you continue to do. Thank you for coming tonight. I want to just show you, because I'm sure you've seen the cover of this <laughs> very beautifully presented book, uh, which I'm just going to flip through because this is the nature of the conversation we'll have tonight. Up to about, oh dear, about here, this is not a recipe book to there. So you learn, it's very readable, you learn an enormous amount about yourself, your brain, what you eat, what other people eat, what you could eat and grow, and all of that stuff. And then along comes all of this beautiful stuff. <laughs> and Maggie has done, uh, I think, a beautiful thing, that while we're reading the science and the um, sometimes 
barrage of information. There are these gorgeous little pieces called things like cauliflower with tahini yogurt dressing, avocado toast, nothing to do with buying a house, with vino <laughs> So there are these little lovely things you can make. And you don't need 150 ingredients to make any of this food. I've made a couple already. So what I'm going to mostly talk about to begin with is the first bit of this book, which is the why and the wherefore. And then we'll come to beautiful food and how we can make it and hopefully keep our brains crack it along as long as they can. Could I first ask you both about your relationship, because I know you met in 2010 at the Australian of the Year um, gathering in Canberra and bonded immediately over food. Maggie, I don't think that meant you went out for dinner particularly. What no. was the nature of the bonding? Well, we were a bit busy. It was a very chaotic time um, when I think about it, having just been named Senior Australian of the Year um, and Ralph was Western Australian of the Year. Um, we, we got just grabs of time at that moment, but enough to know that we needed the conversation to go on and um, it was chaos. It was wonderful chaos. Uh, and we, um, it was when we met later that year in, in Perth when you had, there was a soiree uh, in Perth and when I was on the road trip from Alice Springs to um, Darwin to Perth um, and that's when we really seriously talked about food. But uh, we knew that we wanted to do something together. But this was Ralph's idea, not mine. <laughs> so we know the telly star Maggie. We know the chef Maggie. We cook, know... Cook, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're Simon's the, the cook. chef. Simon's the chef. <laughs> yes. The opera lover, the farmer, um, the extraordinary businesswoman. So we know quite a lot, or we think we do, about you. Ralph, we know a lot about you now once we've read this book too, <laughs> but why does a, a scientist in your area whose father-in-law was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and you describe him as, a, I think, an intellectual giant who went to, from that to requiring total care in six years, which for all of us is a heartbreaking and very tough thing to go through. Where did that lead, or how did that lead to food and Maggie? <laughs> so you're right. I mean, um, he was in his, it was in the mid-80s when he was diagnosed. We didn't know very much about Alzheimer's then. Uh, and uh, I joined a pathologist, a neuropathologist in, in Perth, Professor Colin Masters. And all they could do for diagnosing Alzheimer's then, and even up till now, is only when someone died, you look at their brain and say that they've got amyloid. So that's where we started. And we focused our attention on purifying that amyloid, and now it's, it's, it's a key feature of Alzheimer's. At the same time, uh, a year later, I published a, a paper saying that the brain was under oxidative stress. What does that mean? It means that, for example, you take an apple, you bite it, you expose it to the air, it, it, it becomes brown, it gets rusty. The brain's rusting. So that's what we did then in 1986. No one paid attention to it, but today, everybody recognizes that oxidative stress is a major feature of Alzheimer's. And at this stage, you were doing this on brains of people who had died. Who had died, okay. exactly. That's where we started. And, but what it really means is, so with the amyloid, people are making drugs to treat the amyloid. For the oxidative stress, antioxidants would be one way in helping deal with the Alzheimer's. So that's what led onto the path. But there's a very interesting story because about 12 years ago, a very prominent South Australian scientist based at, 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 yeah, um, at the CSRO, Professor Richard Hedden, I think he's in the audience, I haven't seen him for many years. He brought together a whole bunch of scientists, including myself, Perth, Melbourne, and the CSRO. And scientists can be like you know, wildcats. You know, you've got to really hurt them, as he tell you, with a lot of egos. But they all came together, and they partnered to set up the Australian Imaging Biomarkers Lifestyle Study of Aging. CSR is very strong in lifestyle. I believe in lifestyle, but many of my other colleagues weren't so interested. Uh, so in Perth, we put a lot of attention looking at lifestyle. So that's when it started, and we followed 1,100 Australians for the last now 11 years, uh, and we got a lot of information. And we had two primary questions we wanted to ask. One was, can you diagnose Alzheimer's early? Can you diagnose it before the onset of symptoms? And the technology had advanced to the stage where now you can see amyloid in the brain. 
And what we found was 30% of people who were healthy had no memory problems whatsoever, had their brain full of amyloid. And it's happening at least 20 years before the onset of symptoms. But the other thing that we asked was, does lifestyle matter? And we looked at dietary patterns of eating, and we found with people who took the Western diet, which is more rich in fat and sugars, we found high levels of amyloid in their brain. People who adhered to the Mediterranean style of diet had the lowest levels of amyloid. So that now points us into foods to do with vegetables, fruits, fish, and we're now uh, drilling down deeper, and the, and the plant-based foods seem to have the highest impact. So there are some who are particularly powerful at protecting the brain, and we've sort of illustrated some of them in the book. We will come to some yeah. details. I'm sure everybody has <laughs> it's got their notebook saying, what am I supposed to eat and what aren't I supposed to eat? I've just marked the bit that says avoid <laughs> and the bit that says um, embrace because those are very useful sections. So we'll come back to some of the science. Maggie, I know one of the things always for you has been fresh food, fresh produce that looks and tastes beautiful. And what you've said in here is then you found out more about the science. Yes. You thought you knew a lot about it, which you did, and you learned more. Yes. But you've still stuck with how it looks and how it tastes and ageing and Alzheimer's. How does that all link up? Okay, well, um, I've always believed that good food is medicine and, and that the Mediterranean diet is what we live because we live in a Mediterranean climate. We grow most of our own uh, food. And, and so that's been my whole life in South Australia. We're 40-something years that we've been here. So my belief was... Um, inherent and that it's all about flavour and seasonality and freshness. And then in really meeting Ralph and learning from him the difference and, and there's a phrase that Ralph uses about the rainbow of food. And you see that is that is um, uh, it, it is so important you know these plant based foods so colourful. But what I, the real difference of um, what I learned and put into practice was the fact that understanding more about the why, um, that this vegetable had so much more in the way of antioxidant and nutrient than that vegetable. So every time that I am uh, putting a dish together, flavour is paramount. But flavour and health and pleasure, because without pleasure, um, we're not going to eat well because, you know, that's part of us. We, we love pleasure, we, but we can have it all. Ladies, gentlemen, <laughs> we can have it all. I really, really believe that. Maggie says in this book, I love lashings of butter. <laughs> <laughs> just, not every, just not every day. Yeah, yeah just not it? every day. Yeah. So it is about choices and balance. But learning so much from Ralph about how I put that how of, of, of that supercharge, if you like, and not superfood, I hate that, <laughs> that um, uh, comment. It's, these are, this is natural food, this is food that we've lived with always with some new ingredients um, that have come into it. But it is about flavour and freshness and learning from Ralph too that, um, uh, that omega-3s, there's more omega-3s uh, that are in vegetables as well as fish, um, uh, when it is the freshest. So, I mean, that in itself um, just makes it all make sense to me of what I've always done. So, so it includes food kilometres, doesn't it? If it's taken four months to get here yes, versus yes. was caught yesterday down it, the road. It is, but th that brings up uh, something that's really important to me, and that's not being obsessive about taking things out of your diet, like I'm not going to not have coffee that comes from the other end of the world or from um, the Northern Territory, uh, there's coffee. But so it's, can we have something on our doorstep is number one. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to go without chocolate <laughs> or coffee or things that are really important to my diet. But that is the first, it's like when you um, live in Italy and you go to the markets in Italy, 
every single thing is the ripest and most perfect um, time to be able to cook with. That doesn't happen here. We're not good enough at that because we're too big a country and there are other reasons. Um, but when you can grow anything yourself, even parsley, because this is what I've learned from Ralph, parsley has the highest antioxidant you can imagine. So flat leaf parsley that I throw all over my food and have been doing all my life, along with the extra virgin olive oil. See, it's great. I knew it. <laughs> and it grows but up now I do know it. <laughs> and it, you chuck it around the garden, and even where it doesn't rain in Adelaide, it still grows. Exactly. <laughs> Mediterranean climate. Absolutely. So things, a few words, phrases here, Ralph. Like I said, this is not a diet book, yeah, as in it, it won't make you thin. It's yeah. not about that. <laughs> this is about healthy eating for your entire life, be you 15, 55 or 85. One of the things which interested me, Ralph, was that for all of us, the memory of food and the smells of food are things which we love as children and is almost the last thing to go, isn't it? Exactly. Even if you have Alzheimer's. Exactly. What's that about? In terms of the, the, smell the memory of, of, of the smells of food. I, I think, uh, like I said um, uh, earlier, the food is... Uh, it's, it's a joy. If you enjoy it, it's, it, it basically activates your pleasure centers in the brain. And if, and if it's that strong a, a pleasure, it stays with you a lot longer. And, so and, and if, we we're, if we're feeding somebody rubbish, tasteless rubbish that tastes like cardboard, that's not going to be good for their brain, partly because they won't enjoy it. Is that as simple well, as that? Well, that's part of it. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the nutrition that goes with it is very important. So yes. they've got to go hand in hand, but they've got to enjoy it. And enjoyment is, is critical. And I think that's what points to what Maggie Beer is trying to do here with the Maggie Beer Foundation. And that's why I was so attracted to what she was doing, because I was very passionate about preventing Alzheimer's. Maggie wanted to make a difference with people in aged care facilities and raise the standard of there by making the food delicious and I and I think having it delicious allows it to be sustainable as opposed to diets where you do something and you get sick of it. So in those yeah. places you want to make it all the more appetizing for people in aged care and loaded with nutrition. Now we're only going to get mildly small pea political <laughs> and I'm the only person who's allowed to be critical of the system because these people are too much part of it. However, however, some of us can pay $800,000 if we've got it. Some others can pay $1.5 million to get access to what we think is the best room in the best aged care facility wherever we live in the country. But we might find ourselves eating food that costs $4.50 a day. So we've got an interesting issue here, which Maggie and her foundation and herself have taken on very carefully. When we have institutions which have to run as a business, uh, they have to budget for food. Maggie, it horrified me when I read those figures, $4.50 a day for three meals plus tea and coffee. How are you trying to tackle that? Okay, well, that's the worst I've ever heard of. Um, Sydney Morning Herald two weeks ago. Yes. <laughs> okay. And, um, and there is no doubt I find it just absolutely abhorrent because of all people that need beautiful food and the smells of home cooked food, no matter how large an organisation is, there is no need ever for institutionalised food. But you have to think much more carefully about it, about how you can do it. But particularly the... Um, uh, I'm not so worried about the baby boomers coming into aged care because you've been changing lives forever um, and you'll demand... Um, I'm looking out there at the sea of, of faces here. Just look here. <laughs> you'll demand that we, we have what we need. You have what you need. But those that are in aged care now have had really tough lives, two world wars, depression, and they're not vocal... Um, and if you don't give them um, the right nutrition and pleasure side by side and that every bite counts because they're not um, – uh, then they don't have the energy to be physical that will keep them involved in life. So it's like this big circle. So how are we going about it? 
it's the biggest question ever, but it is about I am um, the foundation doing master classes and finding um, uh, cooks and chefs that come together and giving them ideas and giving them status of being important. These are cooks and chefs, cooks and chefs who work that are in, the aged in aged care, care facilities. It's a huge job and it's very complex. Is it rewarded sufficiently? Um, no, but there's one of the many things that mm. as a foundation we are working on. But it's like the rest of my life and many other lives that will come after me uh, to make a change everywhere, but we are on a path now. Would you tell me a story of inspiration of success you've had so far with that? Yes. Um, it's having 30 cooks um, and or chefs coming together um, uh, from all over Australia, spending two days with us with um, cooking together ideas, listening to their issues, what are their problems, and helping to find solutions. Um, and when they go back in, uh, and then we have for, um, 30 or 40 CEOs that come together on the last day to advocate on the cooks and chefs behalf, by the way. But we bring in specialists to, to give them the feeling of just how important they are and to give them knowledge and to give them a network. And th they go back to their aged care homes and the letters we get, the letters we get from the, um, uh, the letters we get from the residents, the, the bosses, the way, the way when we bring them together, um, when we have soirees in the cities when I'm travelling and they come in and they were unsure of themselves as people and now they're proud and sticking their chest out and bringing their bosses in and are totally different people. And the CEOs? And the CEOs, they need some help. How many CEOs? <laughs> <laughs> but but we're, we're getting to them and we're advocating on, you know, they're cooks and chefs that didn't feel they could ask for a piece of equipment to be fixed when it was broken. Um, they work so hard. So it's, look, it's... A, it's not an easy fix. You've started. But we've started yes. and we see it. We see the pride. We see um, uh, the changes happening. And there is this filter down effect as they become connected to each other so they have support from outside of the business, so to speak. But I've seen uh, a first-hand change that's really impressed me. Because I remember in 2010 when Maggie was talking about really making change in the aged care facilities, many CEOs were defensive, pulled back. And this one particular guy was extremely defensive. And just recently he came to Maggie and asked him to train all his chefs in his aged care facilities in Perth and in Sydney. And I think yeah. that's fantastic. That's inspiring. That's yeah. inspiring. And has he raised the... Um the, the cost of meals per day. So I've got to go and check them out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you see, there are really good places that actually don't even have budgets, and we need them to be our benchmarks because people need to be looked after and given delight as well as nutrition. They do, they do yeah. indeed. Let's go to a bit of science. Um, I want to ask you both this one. Um, foods which are in season, we've talked about are simply fresher and they're more likely to have the goodies that we yeah. need. Whole foods, Maggie, that's a phrase you use. What do, what do we mean, whole foods? Well, non-processed, but uh, having the grains, um, uh, for instance, using spelt and whole wheat where you use the whole of the, the husk, you know, using everything, um, uh, and utilising all our legumes, our chickpeas and lentils that have so much... Um, in the way of nutrition and protein and and I guess if if I put a banner over it, I also mean real food rather than processed real food rather than processed yeah. so if it 's got plastic on it, <laughs> avoid it no, seriously yeah. because lots of us don 't know the difference, do we? What is processed food? Someone said to me not long ago, and I thought gosh that 's an interesting question yes, yes, well, you know. Um, yeah, you could say Fritz is processed food, yes. and, and most South Australians are going to be Fritz. Don't know what Fritz, is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fritz, Bung Fritz, uh, Devon. Oh, yes. Uh, um, but 
And it doesn't mean you never have processed foods, like bacon I will always have, but I won't have it often, and that's gone through a process. But it's, it's the foods that are processed where the sugars are hidden and the preservatives that are used are detrimental to us. So, so that's the, as close the, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great description. The less done to the food, the, the better. The less done to the food, food. real food. Yeah. Real food. Ralph, the spectrum of foods that we need, and again, that's all very beautifully described in here. I'm going to go through the list very briefly. Greens, brightly coloured vegetables. I had a lot of beetroot yesterday. (laughs) The fermented drinks, which are very popular, or foods. Oily fish, the omega-3s, the omega-6s. Beef, lamb, poultry, game, nuts and seeds. Now, we all know that list. Most of us in this room would know that. Um, grains are a bit out of fashion, as you've said at the moment. Well, Something that should, may yeah. be. Should that should be. be. I know should it be. It's a great thing. How do we find what's called a balance, Ralph? Because, my goodness, every sign, every book, every shop offers you different advice, doesn't it? I guess so. Um, but it's. Uh, I think those recipes are the way that the balance is happening, because Maggie's take into account what we think are good for, is good for us and put it into our recipes. And obviously, you can't get them all in one hit. You've got to have you know, different meals at different times and different combinations. Well, in different fact, ways. you make that point, point. don't you? That critical. a balanced diet doesn't mean it's, it's, you have to have all 15 food groups no way in one have meal. It, yes. yeah. it could be across a month. Yeah. Yes? Yes, but the thing that I'd like to say about that is... Ralph directed me in terms of all the things that were going to make a difference, right? And, and so I thought about this totally differently. Um, and in having, if you can imagine a spreadsheet that had, um, uh, that had the purple colored vegetables, the red colored vegetables, the oily fish, um, uh, the, the, the legumes, the um, uh, every, every element, the, the fats, the good fats. So I, absolutely as a spreadsheet to pull all as many good things together in every dish. But because it was from Ralph that I, I learned the more variety we have, the, the better. Um, and that comes back to seasonality. And enjoyment. And, and enjoyment. And flavour. Yes. Mm, all uh, of them. All of, all of those things. But it was just about putting as much as we could in every single recipe. But balance, it, you know, you, you mentioned those little notes in the front. And so things like when you're busy, um, a tin of sardines on toast with some beetroot, a beetroot relish is, is a meal in itself. You know, you don't have to cook a recipe through every time. Those, I, I call them post-it notes, those, those little ideas that can happen um, just so very, very quickly. Um, so and so you've reminded us in this book, the sardines are the oily fish. Yeah. If you have it on sourdough bread, you're doing well. Exactly. If you put a bit of hummus with it, you're doing better. Yes, and exactly. be to it even better. And yes. avocado. And <laughs> avocado. <laughs> Smashed avocado. Smashed. We know someone in the audience that knows all about to- that. We've told people vegetables are good for you. I was told vegetables are good for me. I never liked vegetables for many years. You know, but no one told me why they were so good for me. Uh, and, and as I've started to learn about all the different vegetables, so, you you know, I love your hair, by the way. I love that beetroot colour. Like the beetroot. <laughs> but beetroot, who would, how many people in this room would know that beetroot is very good for keeping blood pressure down? I didn't know that. Oh, very good. That's very impressed. Uh, you know, how good I, is roast beetroot? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. So, so this is you know, the, what we identify. Um, the other thing is in parsley that Maggie mentioned. It's got a compound called apigenin, very powerful anti-inflammatory agent without side effects. You know, so my colleagues at the University of Western Sydney are doing some very fascinating research. Uh, they, but the, unfortunately, you can't have a sprinkling of it. You've got to have 50 grams of it to get a good benefit. So Maggie will make it work somehow. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and when we think of something like that, we have to talk about the South Australian climate and the fact that pomegranates grow as weeds. Yes, and yes. Um, they do. We've got 200 pomegranate bushes oh, wow. at home as, as um, uh, hedges. But... 
I'll let Ralph talk about the science of it because it's really important. But when um, putting the book together, when I did the, the sort of almost fi almost final spreadsheet, there were 16 recipes with pomegranate arils because I have them so available. And you are so fashionable. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And so I had to pull it back because not everyone has that. Uh, we used but, to throw them at each other well, as children. Well, my grandchildren, that's, that's what they thought they were for. <laughs> but the flavour of pomegranate, yeah. and every South Australian should have a pomegranate bush in three years. <laughs> you can have, you know, just the most amazing flavour profile, but the science is extraordinary on pomegranates. Give us a dose of pomegranate, so please, Ralph. I've always been promoting pomegranates because within pomegranates there's an ingredient that I've told you about beta amyloid being bad for your brain, but there's an ingredient there that blocks the production of beta amyloid. So that's why I was so interested in it. And there's a, the drug companies, as we speak, are actually making it synthetically to do drug trials. Uh, so that's but we can one. just eat the pomegranate and I mean, enjoy it. You know? yes, and the amyloids something. are the things which brains have if you have Alzheimer's. So beta amyloid yes. basically builds up. Okay. As we get older, it builds up. Unfortunately, if you have a, a strong a genetic cause of it, it happens yes. much earlier. And then it's very toxic and kills brain cells. Okay. So whatever you can do to keep it down, and food is one way of doing that, eating some of these foods. So you're very clear, Ralph, in your, in your scientific sections that... It affects a lot of people, Alzheimer's and various dementias. Um, there is no known cure at no. the moment. The best we can do is slow it down, fend it off a bit at this stage. I want to ask you about foods that have more chance of protecting our brains than others. Which are the ones apart from pomegranate? So, 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 so basically, plant-based foods are plant -based. The, is what I would say. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, we look at the Mediterranean list. Uh, they talk about fruits and vegetables and fish, and fish are the other big players. So the mega trees are really very powerful, as are all the different antioxidants. And when you think about plants, we're just not thinking antioxidants. We're thinking about fiber, soluble fiber, you know, and, and insoluble fibers. That's an essential part. And again, where the processed food comes in, not only does it add, do they have too much sugar or salt, a lot of the fiber is pulled out. So for example, I tell many of our juices that are sold commercially have, have those ingredients missing. They've been so if out. you buy a commercial juice, it can A, have its fibre taken out. It's very likely to be very high in sugar, sugar exactly. isn't it? Exactly. Guess he's just been to the dentist today. <laughs> but they're shockingly high in They're sugar. absolutely shocking. And, and that's yeah. where the, the biggest killer, and if you still got our tree, we put, mm. take sugar sparingly. And we don't yeah. mean sugar as in terms of natural sugar and fruits right. and food. But the, the added sugar, the hidden added sugar, yes. like, you know, you go to, everyone has been obsessed with fat in their diet. You know, they go into low-fat meals, but guess what? That's loaded with sugar. Yep. Yeah, and, and often the ones which are called low-fat have got more sugar, exactly. or the ones which are low-sugar have got more fat. Yeah, and more you can spend your whole life reading those silly labels, can't you? <laughs> Where we can just buy a pomegranate, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or fresh fish. Or fresh fish. Or walnuts. Now, walnuts are very rich in, in, in omega-3s. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which is, okay. uh, as are the, the chia seeds, which I learned that from Maggie. Yeah. Yeah. And so there are some nuts and chia seeds. Chia seeds. Yeah, okay. 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 But nuts. I mean, nuts, um, walnuts, Brazil nuts, selenium for the brain, um, uh, walnuts, how amazing they are. Almonds, you know, uh, there is so much that is beautiful to eat and so available And um, so we have to, to it us. seems to me, look at our, if we're, if we're chefs, cooks, home yeah. cooks, we have to look at our recipes a little differently rather than saying, yeah. I'm cooking page 23 tonight, right, I need to go and buy those things. Yeah. I think we have to actually start at the shop and say what's what's in season, don't you? You've got to, first of all, have a, having a good pantry or larder, it makes it really easy, but be seduced by whatever is looking so brilliant and fresh and start with that, because if it's in season, I hope it'll be in here, because I've tried to cover, well, we did it over well, um, in fact, a year and a half, so we did four seasons and then we did another two because we'd learned more. Um, and um, it's, it, that is the way to go. Don't be fixated on a recipe. It's just an idea. It's an idea to start, but because of all the ingredients are there. But I have to say something about low fat. That's where our 
whole society, I feel, went wrong 40 years ago when low fat became the thing. Um, and so that, that hidden sugar and that lack of being satisfied um, and so always wanting to eat more. Whereas if you have good fats and you're sated, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I've been, I was saying it before science agreed with me. Um, and I feel justified. <laughs> good on you, Maggie. And you talk about the good, <laughs> very good. And you talk about the good fats, the you know the avocados. Yes, yeah. Very good fats, and they're olive really oil. good. And olive oil is another very good. Uh, yeah, but but uh, but and it can help you take up your anti some of the antioxidants. You know the fat soluble, insoluble antioxidants. The bad fats? Uh, no, the good fats. Yeah, well, I want you to tell me what the bad fats the are. The bad about. fats are the long chain fatty acids. So that's why people. The long chain fatty, fatty acids. Fatty acids. And, and they're, found they're found in meats. Says, they're, Ralph, they're found in meats. But it <laughs> never meat. says on the packet this is full of long chain no. fatty acids. <laughs> So how do we know that yeah. they're there? So, so uh, by our pyramid, we talk about uh, basically uh, having a lot less of red meat, for example. Yes. That's a very rich source of long-chain fatty acids. Okay. And even if you have trimmed meat, they still have a huge amount of these fats there. And it doesn't mean uh, no meat, it's no, no, less meat. Less meat, yeah. less meat. Yeah, okay, uh, long so, chain fatty acids. Yes, it's, and, and so basically those are the fats that deposit. Those are the fats that are associated with, with heart disease. And we think they're also associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we feed, say for example, animals with these particular kind of fats, we get the amyloid building up. So we feed the animals yes. to give us something which is really bad for us. No, 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 this is experiments. Oh, <laughs> sorry. That's right. to, to, right. to understand how it's, no, no. That's all right. But, but you're probably right too. So that's why people talk about grain fed cattle we, as opposed to. We've <laughs> mentioned um, the diagnosing of Alzheimer's has come a huge way because I remember yes, as, an, yes. as a young journalist yes. first hearing about Alzheimer's and the only way that people could find out if they'd had it was when they were dead and I thought gosh that's a bit drastic. We've come a long way. As you're saying the symptoms often start 10, 20 years before any symptoms develop. Yes. The job is to try and slow it down. Yes. Genes, what part do genes play? Genes play a huge role. Uh, so in our over here in this room, there'll be 15% of, of us that would carry what we call the major genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's. It's called APOE4, A-P-O-E4. It's been, it was long known by the cardiovascular people to be associated with cardiovascular disease, higher cholesterol. Uh, and again, there's an intimate association between high cholesterol and high amyloid. There is a connection. Yes, oh, okay. but, no, uh, but more recently, when I say recently in the mid-90s, a very prominent scientist in America, Professor Alan Roses, showed this gene was associated with Alzheimer's disease, and no, everyone refused to believe him. They ignored him. And now, throughout the world, in every population, it's been established to be the major genetic risk factor. So the problem is, those of us who've got that APOE4, and so it's 15% of us in this room, Half the people who get Alzheimer's disease will carry that gene. So that shows how important a gene so is. So do we rush around getting tested to see if we've got it? It's up to us, but we can... Uh, uh, what, but what is the benefit of it? So when it came out in 1993, many people said, or the, or the clinicians who know best, and, and the scientists who know best, or thought they know best, we're not going to give it out to anybody and not encourage anyone because we don't know what to do about it. Now, again from this ABLE study, we see very clear benefits in terms of lifestyle modification. So, so if you, can't you know be, you've got it, you tend to live more healthily? Is that what you're saying? Exactly, and okay. you, you can take steps to modify that risk. So you can't change your gene, but okay. you can change the expression of the gene. You can turn it on or off by your lifestyle habits. So one of the studies we also did, uh, and I'm sort of dovetailing now with other factors of lifestyle that have an impact, was to look at people's physical activity profiles. And we found that those people who did worse gene, no physical activity, but had this gene, their amyloid levels were elevated. The same group who had this gene, but did some exercise, it came down. And those who did regular exercise were the same as those who didn't have the gene. So it's the same message, so, isn't it? So, yeah. Eat well, eat yeah. fresh and beautiful food, exercise. And not only that, there's another component, and that is um, uh, that is about being connected um, and having pleasure in life and being connected to a community or a reason for being. Um, they're all of the things that come together. And, and, and music, 
Um, we both sing in a choir. Yeah, yeah, incredibly, incredibly powerful. Whatever you belong to matters, yes. doesn't it? Yeah, whatever. And if you don't, find something to belong to. Um, so it is one of the one of the parts of the puzzle. Yes. I want to do this slightly grim thing with you, if we could, for a second. What actually happens to our brains when we do develop Alzheimer's? Unfortunately, uh, our brain cells die, and our brains may be starting at this level, and they start shrinking, and selected areas of the brain shrink much more rapidly than others, and those are the, the areas of the brain to do with learning and memory. And that's why those are the symptoms that tend to happen earlier. But we also see behavioral changes, and that's something not talked about with Alzheimer's. And they're usually the harder things to manage. As a carer, uh, it's easy to care for someone. But so there can be anger. Anger, yes, yes. As, as, and, and other things, uh, uh, or they become withdrawal. Because yeah. the cells are shrinking, they're so dying? The cells are dying. They're dying. In, in, in particular regions of the brain, and, the, and that part of the brain which is associated with putting down memories is very close to what we call the limbic system to do with our emotions, <coughs> and that's where the behavior linkage comes in. Okay, okay. To do that. It's a whole other session on music and <laughs> Alzheimer's, but we're not going to do that. Um, various diets. We've mentioned the Mediterranean diet, but there are other parts of the world, aren't there, that have much lower incidences of heart disease, of dementia, like Japan. Japan. Could you talk a little about well, which of you would like to do Japan? Well, so yes, maybe perhaps, went there. <laughs> perhaps I will. And, and um, interestingly that... The book and the recipes in the book are so Mediterranean diet um, uh, focused, but there are ingredients um, that uh, have definitely come in from my love of Japan and um, understanding the health benefits of unpasteurized miso, for instance, um, and, and many other ingredients that they have. But Okinawa is one of the great examples of longevity um, in Japan. And uh, more, perhaps in Sardinia and, and another part of Italy, there are similar long-lived people that are active right through to their 90s and beyond, um, where they're still physically involved in life. They're in the gardens. Their diet is based particularly in Okinawa on the purple potato that has particular nutrient. But being Okinawa, they also eat Spam because of the American occupation. So what I mean to say about that is um, uh, if you're having all the good things about your diet, your involvement, your physical activity and being part of a community and you eat Spam, sometimes it's fine. So that could open a conversation about red wine, I'm sure. Um, so what would you like to say about red wine? <laughs> well, Ralph, Ralph put it in there, only four glasses a week. <laughs> How many four glasses a week? So that wasn't my research. Please don't hold it against me. Uh, well, I don't drink at all. So between us, we can average out in my day. Isn't that ridiculous? So what, what do you have? Well, I've... So I've, between us, we can, we can do an average of well, three. Well, in fact, the average of three is quite different. If you've given it up, I just... Um, I only drink um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And um, so every glass counts. And no quaffing wine, thank you. Only beautiful wine. But it works for me. Um, because my life is so crazy, still doing 70 hours a week. I can't do it any other way. But you go to the gym too, don't you? Uh, I go to the gym twice a week now, but it's a passive kind of gym. It's not a rah-rah gym. It's a stress. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, and I walk, but, and, and I love it. I'm very physically active. But there's sort of a balance between... Um, I mean, my Colin won't give up having a glass of wine every night, and nor will Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> so that's so, where we uh, have a balance between the three of us do, up here. Yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've really got it. I think I'm getting it pretty right with the diet. As it turns 60 to get it just right. But then my, my love for that other fluid stuff is, is very hard to change. <laughs> what about uh, chocolate? Chocolate? And chocolate too, unfortunately. See, but, but uh, you know... Chocolate's in here, it's okay. But more than 70% is good for you, but I'm still trying to get used to that. Oh, yes, he doesn't like the bitter taste of, of good chocolate. You know, one thing I love about this book, uh, there's no guilt. No, that's exactly. so important. Exactly. It, it's uh, a guilt-free uh, book. Uh, yes, I really like that. 
Okay, there will be a chance for you to ask questions at the end, by the way. I'm just going to go through now a couple of, a bit of a list of things, um, just to find out what they are and where we'll find them. So, micronutrients. Ralph? Yes. Could you just quickly give us a micronutrient story? So you, you find them in most of your vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and they're usually uh, uh, small compounds. Vitamins are also kind of micronutrients. They help to basically facilitate action. So they help enzymes do their business, for example. Uh, so again, yeah. to fend off, slow down... Yes. the dementia, we should have a go at these, which we'll find in the usual list. And, and this is where the whole food is good. Whole you know, food, because they have fresh Most food. of them have them, and we've, and we've listed them, okay. uh, specific uh, micronutrients in each one, and that's where okay. you've got to have that balance and have that whole... These array. are all very easily explained <laughs> in very short paragraphs. <laughs> um, the antioxidant debate, oh my goodness. It came and it went and it came back again, and then I tried to read a choice magazine um, to tell me what to buy and eat. And I love Choice magazine, but I just went cross-eyed. You know? <laughs> so, Maggie, what's your story on antioxidants? Well, I, I think when Ralph described it um, uh, about the apple, we all know when we um, cut an apple and leave it, or, or an avocado, leave it too long, um, it becomes rusted unless you put some verjuice over it <laughs> <laughs> or some lemon juice. And what was that? <laughs> verjuice. <laughs> oh, verjuice. Um, um, and, and I think that, that it, it, is about, um, it, it is about the antioxidants that are in um, so many fruits and vegetables that are so powerful. Oxygen spoils a lot of food. And, and so we need every bit of antioxidant that we can to do us good. Um, and, but go for the most, for me, I just go for the most powerful. I mean, it, what's interesting, another thing I've learned from Ralph and, um, is about gubbinge or kakadu plum. The amount of antioxidant in the kakadu plum uh, is more than blueberry. Um, and so it's finding, and I love the flavour. Um, and can I just say, um, Eliza Taylor is in the audience tonight, and she cooked every single recipe with me. Oh, and the oh, work that she did oh, from oh. afar in Western Australia, we did it by remote until we did the photography together. I think applause, because this Please. is a great yes. 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 Eliza, take a bow. <laughs> and... There is a section in here on Native Australian foods. Yes, and, and how powerful that yes, they are yes, yes. in terms of their antioxidants and spices, how powerful they are. Um, and these are all... So, you know, you never want to stop learning, and I've learned so much from Ralph. Folate, we hadn't heard of 10 years ago, and folate is everywhere. How, where does that work, Ralph? So, so folic acid basically was associated with cardiovascular disease. Again, this link between cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's. And it's been shown to lower homocysteine, which is, which is the factor that causes cardiovascular disease. But it's also been playing a major role in, in, in targeting the brain. It's associated with stroke. So folic brings it down. So if you get enough folic. Again, we've got to be careful because there are some people who may not have the right enzymes so, but they're very rare. But most people will get a benefit from folic acid. I mean, acid. if we pig out on anything, it's not good for us, is it? <laughs> oh, sometimes. Yeah, so, oh, well, okay, red uh, a little wine, of something, right. too much is, yeah. Um, folate, where do we find folate other than... Green the, leafy vegetables. Green leafy vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> we're the same thing. Um, supplements. Taking the pill rather than eating the food. And that's why we said we're talking about going back to basics. You know, I think okay. we've all got almost brainwashed to think we're missing this and we're missing that because actually we're moving away from eating that whole array of healthy food. So I think uh, the more we, we stick with the healthy food, the less need for the supplements. And, and so it's, and, much cheaper. And they, so much they cheaper. are incredibly expensive. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and we think sometimes that, for example, some of the, I shouldn't mention anything specific, but omega-3s, we stress that's really important. But yes. some of the trials that have been done with some of these supplements with omega-3s haven't been so promising. And I think, you know, there may be a number of factors there. That's where getting it as fresh as possible. Yes. The fresher the fish, the healthier the omega, better the omega-3. I am, I am an obsessive reader of Joyce magazine, and I was looking at probiotics and prebiotics ah, well, recently. Yes. And that, well, perhaps I'll come to you yeah. in a second, but <laughs> it was pretty scary, actually, yes. reading 
the list of what you can buy and what it says yeah. you'll get, that's hard enough, like I want, you know, 45 million of the thingamies. But the tests then showed that most, a huge number of the probiotics we buy don't actually even have what it says on the label. Yeah. Well, you're much better at getting all this from nature. Yeah. Let's say the prebiotics at the moment. You've got um, globe artichokes. We're having every night globe artichokes and asparagus. They're in season. They're uh, onions, garlic. Um, these are wonderful prebiotics. Probiotics, yes, they have to be looked after properly and they have to be added at the right time to be valid. And so um, there is so much we need to learn, yes. Read Joyce Frank's <laughs> <laughs> Or read Michael Mosley's book, The Clever Gut Diet. I thought that had a lovely Michael way. Mosley, yeah. yes. I, th which brings me just briefly, if I could, mm -hmm. to the fermented drink <laughs> thing that Michael Mosley made, very famous, and I was there making the kombucha <laughs> and stuff for a while. Yes. What, what's your line on the fermented drink slash foods? I learned the fermenting drink food more from Maggie and more recently oh, from, from, yeah. from, from Michael Mosley. But there's a huge uh, value, in, and, and now for Alzheimer's, they're paying a lot more attention to it. Okay. Because, again, you need that good bacteria to metabolize some yes. of those compounds that have a positive effect on your brain. So, again, coming back to the pomegranate juice, oh. there are ingredients there where it's metabolized by the healthy bacteria to make these compounds called, technical term is urolithins, which are very important in extending life. So that's an example of why you need that good bacteria. Sadly, we, we put that out of kilter with taking too much antibiotics too frequently. Oh, and that's one example where we throw it out. So, and Maggie, more on fermenting, if you will. Well, yes, and, and that's the thing that I've, I've added in, um, you know, over and above the Mediterranean diet. But when I think about the Barossa fermented foods, we've always, you know, dill pickles, um, uh, a fermented wine is fermented, um, um, cabbage, um, sauerkraut. sauerkraut. It's all part of the tradition of putting food down. And now the more we learn um, about the importance of the gut, uh, and kefir, um, I I love it, but it's got to be kefir that tastes good. Even Who's though go at kefir at making kefir. Kefir, kefir. I, I just yeah, love because yeah. I love the sour flavour of kefir, yeah, yeah. but it's also got to have other redeeming features. Not everyone loves sour. Uh, like I do, but these are all part and parcel. But I just want to flip one thing to omega threes um, mm -hmm. that I was just thinking. One of the things I learned when um, just last week when I rang the CSIRO in Canberra, I, I had a fish question that I wanted a, a really, a really exact answer on, and uh, a South Australian who's the head of fisheries in CSIRO, the research, um, and he said mussels. In South Australia, our mussels are so cheap. They're almost like the perfect food in terms of omega-3, in terms of being affordable, and in terms of, he said, if you were only allowed one food to sustain life, mussels would be the more complete food that you could ever get. I thought that was you get so... get going on the jetty. Yeah, I thought that was so That's interesting. That because we always talk about fish and the expense of fish, mm. because it is, it is, and we need it, but here we've got bustles, and tin sardines are good too. <laughs> salt. What's the story on salt? Oh, don't be obsessive about it. If you have a, if you have a health condition, then, um, then obviously you've got to follow... Um, uh, what you are told by your, your doctors. But if you use salt, salt brings out flavor, but use salt at the beginning um, uh, so you don't um, add more salt later. Um, it's about using good salt. And it's, uh, I could not cook without salt, but I, I don't like salty food. Does it have to be pink from Pakistan? No, no. Our Murray River salt, our Murray River salt um, has, has such fantastic um, nutrient in it and, and uh, minerals that it is, what is the salt, Himalayan salt that they say is the best in the world, but the 
Murray River salt sits there and we've got really good salt, Olsen salt in South Australia. But don't buy the totally processed salt. Buy good salt and good pepper. Um, Yes. I want to go to Iron, and in particular, perhaps to you, Ralph, on this one. Sure. I uh, was fascinated by a podcast I heard just very recently from um, researchers in Melbourne who are working, I know, as you are, on, I think I've got this right, on people who have Alzheimer's who have a lot more iron stored in various parts of a bit of the brain than other people. And so there's a move to not get rid of iron because we need it but I know lots of people are giving out meat, red meat for instance yeah. what's the story with iron and Alzheimer's right now? So, so if, if you remember I talked about oxidation of the brain you yes. know, this rusting of the brain yes. iron is probably the most effective way to make that oxidation happen to make the rusting happen and so what people have shown and this was before this work in Melbourne with our colleagues our colleagues in the US were looking at uh, when they looked at uh, uh, people having amyloid in their brain, um, the amyloid itself seemed to be quite inert. But once there was iron with the amyloid, that's when the, 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 the rate of decline was a lot faster. And this is what the, our colleagues in, in Melbourne have shown. Uh, that, and and, the, and head, the, the head honcho has gone vegetarian, I noticed. He, he's been vegetarian for a while, but he's gone much more so after he, more saw, so. he saw this. And it fits with the red meat. So, uh, so that's Professor Ashley Bush at the Florey Institute. Uh, uh, and, so and he's basically shown that. We've now looked at it in the blood, and we see that levels in the blood are associated with people who have high amyloid in their brain preclinically. So again, it fits with, with that notion. And what he's doing now is trying to use... Uh, uh, a compound that would lower the iron levels. And there's a trial, by the way. And there's, there's, a, there's a clinical Institute trial that, that they're trying to run. They're trying to make yes. it everywhere. Yes, if you could have it in every on state. to the Florey <laughs> Institute and away you go. Um, let me just whiz down this. Trans fats. Trans fats are the worst. Trans fats? Yes. That's the same as those long chain ones, is it? No, they get oxidised. So they get highly oxidised. How do we spot a trans fat? And, and I... <laughs> <laughs> We avoid cooking in, uh, I think Maggie probably answered better than me, but some of the pastries that you get in the past, uh, you know, had, used to have lots of trans fats in them, so heavy, heavy cooking in oils that get hydrogenated very readily were a problem. Margarine used to be a problem. You know, we were corrected uh, more recently when I was writing the book about margarine, stay away from margarine, but they now have very strong controls so they don't allow trans fats in there, so at least we can have our margarine in peace in Australia. Well, uh, we have to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's better, as, Ma as Maggie would say. So trans fats really, and, and this is where I'd like to come to coconut oil, uh, yeah. uh, because that's an area which is still a little bit controversial. People in the, in the heart area still say it's bad, but they put all saturated fat in the bad basket. Yeah. You know? But again, when I talk about these long fats, which are bad for you, in coconut oil, they have what we call medium chain fats. Most of them get burnt into give you ketone bodies. So they tend to burn rather than deposit. And the interesting thing about the, that saturated fat is it doesn't oxidize so readily. So if we were cooking in that, we had less likelihood of getting that to oxidize and form trans fats. So that's another reason why I would say coconut oil is a good oil to use for cooking. So, um, so for the chef or mum or dad at home yeah. making tea, making dinner, what yeah. do you go for if you're using fat? Well, I, extra virgin olive oil is my first go-to, but I certainly use extra virgin coconut oil. And when there is, um, when there is a, a reason for being as well, like uh, a fish curry with coconut, um, a beautiful um, coconut um, uh, um, dessert, um, I, I, I do, I hear enough anecdotal information uh, from people, particularly carers, that are giving extra virgin coconut oil to their um, uh, spouses that they're looking after, that how it helps. And as Ralph explains, it sort of, it fires the brain, you know, it, it actually gives energy to the brain. Um, and you're just about to embark on a very large research project with Macquarie on, on University. Well, there's been lots of anecdotal evidence, and there was a, a lady, Dr. Mary Newport, who was a, she would basically work with young children, babies, premature babies, and she looked at formulations and getting them to, to take off and, 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 and survive. Uh, her husband, unfortunately, got Alzheimer's at the age of 51, so that was very, very young. And she was looking at ways in which she could sort of help him, and, and she came upon this formulation with coconut oil. It had a quite a 
profound effect on him. Obviously, this is not a cure, but it raised his quality of life very considerably. Um, and then there have been many reports throughout, uh, throughout the world, but they're all case studies. Uh, and so what we're doing at Macquarie University is doing an actual proper clinical trial to address this question. Uh, and how long will that take? So that'll think? take about six months for us to look okay. at the effects of okay. it. Uh, well, what, we, the, what the argument is made is that when people get Alzheimer's disease, and even prior to Alzheimer's disease, and people who've got a high risk factor, like that genetic risk factor, their ability to use glucose is diminished. And sometimes scientists use this term, type 3 diabetes of the brain. There was a famous scientist in, in, in the US who showed that. So the ability to use glucose diminishes, the brain cells start dying. With ketone bodies, the brain can take it up very readily. And it acts as an alternate, well, I use the word alternate petrol supply for the brain. So if I can raise their, their quality of life, give them energy, then other things like treatment approaches may be more effective. So that's Which objective. is likely to come through what in food, do you think? The treatment approaches, you mean? Yes. Uh, well, I think in food, many of these antioxidants would be helpful. But there are also drug approaches that we've got to consider. Okay. Okay. But if the brain's virtually dying or all close to that stage, then no treatment's going to be effective. Nuts and seeds have been mentioned a little bit. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. Sometimes a lot. people get very concerned and say, they're full of fat, don't go near uh, them. Well, um, yes. Uh, nuts have amazing uh, properties of protein, of, of um, and they very particular, particularly the Brazil nuts. I had no idea. I didn't bother with Brazil nuts. I do now, straight to the brain. <laughs> um, but they have so much flavour. They they allow um, such diversity uh, and and seeds. Um, I just uh, there are so many things you can do to give texture. Food needs texture as well as flavour. And, and nuts and seeds can do that. But once again, it is whether they're rancid or not. And every nut should always be kept in the fridge, by the way. Um, and every walnut has got to be roasted and the skin's rubbed off because they're rancid um, unless they're fresh and it's impossible to know whether they're fresh or not. Um, and you've so, got to look after your oil, by the way, back to oil, don't uh, Yes, you? well, certainly the nut oils must be in the fridge and extra virgin olive oil must be away from light and heat. Um, and um, so it's, there's a whole lot of small detail that makes a difference in life no matter what we do. And once you know them, it's just part and parcel of, of um, doing things better. But um, I, couldn't, I couldn't cook without nuts. The FODMAP diet is very fashionable at the moment, isn't it? Yes, well... Does anybody want to talk about FODMAP? Well, uh, yes, it's quite new, isn't it? Yes. But Monash University are doing amazing work on the FODMAP. And uh, um, an Adelaide woman who was a, a chef, I knew as an apprentice and a chef, is now an academic at, um, at Monash. And so she's working on the FODMAP and cooking everything that she comes um, uh, up with. Um, and FODMAP is just people that cannot take onions and garlic and and, and some Apples, other... Apples, pears. Yes. But it's quite a collection. Yes, it's quite it? a collection, but onion, uh, there's a huge collection if you are so... Um, uh, uh, if it is affecting you as such. But the fact that there's so much work being done on it means the more we know, the better lives we can lead. And essentially, from my understanding, yeah. which is really basic, I've got a music degree, not a science degree, uh -huh. it's about our gut. It's all about the gut. Which, again... Yes affects our behaviour, our brain, our oh, activity. Abs absolutely. And we've loved meeting Michael Mosley and, and we, we love to read him. But, um, and the things that we have learned since then, but um, uh, the, the gut is another brain. It's huge, isn't yes. it? Yes, yes. The people are talking about, yeah. this is the bacteria in your gut. The good is, bacteria. The good bacteria, yes. I'm sorry, yeah. which is now being considered as an organ, isn't yes. it, by some yes. scientists. Yes. And, and because society has given us um, uh, too much antibiotic, um, because it is in our food without knowing it, in some foods, and um, it's done so much good in the health sector, it... it you know, people can have it too often and become, uh, yes, their guts become affected. So, so often, for instance, if we buy chicken from certain places, it yeah. won't say this chicken is loaded with antibiotics. Yeah. 
They are, but they often are, aren't they? Well, yes. Um, um, many mass-produced chickens are, are given it as a preventative, and there's no way you will know. It's only when you come across um, a producer that is doing it uh, and says proudly, I do not give antibiotics, um, uh, that you will know. So it's odd whenever I see that sign, uh, I think, oh, antibiotics, uh, and don't buy it. Yes. <laughs> Someone's mentioned antibiotics. Uh, I think we might pause there and um, move to questions. And we have some people around the audience. Perhaps if you have a microphone, you could just make yourself apparent. So where are our microphone people? Here's Renee. Here's one. Another one up here. If you have a question, would you like to just raise your hand? A question for either Maggie, obviously, or, or Ralph. And yes, we'll go to you, Renee. Um, my question goes to Professor Martins. Um, I've been told by um, various doctors not to eat too much of the small fish because they're high in mercury. My question is, um, is this the case for wherever they are harvested or is it a matter of where a particular place, maybe Southeast Asia, I don't know, um, that they are more likely to have uh, this mercury content. So by small fish, I think he was talking about sardines and other... Um, hmm. Which of you would like to answer yeah. that one? So I'm happy for you. I, 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 could, I, could, I could start. <laughs> you, you go first. Well, um, I, I, I'm, it's just that just last week I had this amazing conversation with the CSIRO in Canberra about this. And firstly, I would say... Um, that we talked about sardines and how great they are, and, and we're talking local sardines, but because we pay so little for them, the fishermen aren't looking after them as well as they could be looked after, that they could be just so exceptional. But uh, I had to throw that in because it's about quality. But what he said um, is that the CSIRO have got the most fabulous website about it, um, CSIRO at Canberra about all the myths about fish. Um, go to if you have a particular um, issue about that, and I don't know the answer, but it's not. I haven't heard it from the point of view of our local fish. But go to that website because that it handles nice. all of those very specific questions. Lovely. I haven't had time yet. So I think Maggie's spot on. That website's excellent. But I think if we get fish from other countries, the regulations are a bit different. And so that's where we pay more attention to. But we also got to be careful about tinned fish. I'm probably getting in trouble over this uh, because we think we're getting all our omega 3s. And I used to be so proud that I've changed my diet and I have a bowl of salad and I have a tinned fish every day. But unfortunately, the, and the tuna, the, the omega-3 is actually sucked out before you get the, the fit in. And there is some mercury in it. Uh, if you had it once a week, it wouldn't be an issue. But if you had it every day like I was doing, it could be tuna an issue. Tuna from anywhere? Yeah, most, most of the tuna pros, commercial ones. Right. But that's why I say sardines, because <laughs> they've got the bones, they've got the whole fish. You have to look for sardine. You have to find someone to sell you sardines. Oh, fresh sardines. Yes. Very and, hard to find. And it is because we don't revere them. We don't respect them. Yeah. So we're not asking for them. We're not, yeah, yeah, we're not seeing it as a resource. And so they go to um, uh, be pulverised and used as... I don't work for the ABC anymore, so I can say that capos, I think, will do. Do you fresh like the sardines? <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> Another question, please. The lady with the blue shirt. There's a microphone coming. Um, yeah, on the, uh, the fish debate, yeah, I've heard lots of stories about canned um, fish because, um, you know, it can come from the fish is caught um, in areas where, um, you know, anything can happen to it and certain currents come from polluted areas and that sort of thing. So, you know, there is issues with canned foods, especially fish. Um, but my question is... Um, What's your, it doesn't matter who can answer this question, but do you have an opinion about foods that are either acidic or alkaline? I was just wondering about that. Acidic or alkaline. Is that an so, issue? So, that, not, we've not, uh, so in terms of Alzheimer's, I've heard people talk about that, but we don't have any experience. So, in with terms that. Of, of brain, of and the brain Alzheimer's, health, yeah. particularly, yeah. it's so not I, come I, across yeah, your we, horizon. We, we, no. 
We, we haven't really looked at that. And I no, guess we, we haven't. Do. We've got a whole list of things we want to pay attention to, and it's something that probably is worth looking at, but it, it hasn't hit, on our, hit our radar yet. Okay, thank you. Another question. Down the front here in a yellow... Just giving Renee her daily exercise. <laughs> It's very interesting. Thank you both. Very, well, three of you, very much indeed. And I quite agree with you about sardines. Um, and sardines for breakfast on toast with tomatoes is lovely too. Um, what I wanted to say was I've had a quick flick through your book and I noticed that um, you do have recipes for um, two serves as well as four. But one of my um, complaints um, at the moment, or gripes, whatever you like, is that... Um, there are so many households now where there are two people or one person, and there are very, very few cookbooks on the market that have recipes for two people. Mm. Now, it's very easy to um, double a recipe, but it's not so easy to decrease it. Um, Delia Smith did one years ago, one is fun, but I think there's time for a new cookbook. I'd love to do one, but I, I'm not equipped. And the, may I also ask, parsley, yes, I eat a lot of parsley. I've also understood that parsley is particularly good for women because it's full of estrogen, is that correct? Not sure about that one. Okay, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julie. Ask Dr. Carl. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, Dr. Carl. But uh, I think you're right. There needs to be, I'm not going to do it because I don't have time, but Rita Ehrlich um, um, did one, Cooking for Two, uh, did a book called Cooking for Two, um, a Melbourne food writer, some time ago. And I think there is a real need both for um, students particularly and, and people on their own. Um, it is... It, it is it is an issue. And leftovers? And oh, no, oh leftovers. leftovers. I know. Oh, leftovers, is, there shouldn't be any such thing because you just look in your fridge and you think, what can I do with it? Yes. 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 Just put it just all together. For it. Yeah. I want to go back to the estrogen question because that's a very important question. So estrogen is very important for the brain. And we've known about it for a long time that it's very important to bring amyloid down. And we think in menopause, when estrogen hits the, hit the lowest, amyloid goes up. And we're now seeing it for testosterone in men, in andropause. Uh, so definitely, that it, it, it will. Ha it, I think it has a huge benefit, but I can't see us getting it from plants. So you need to have. <laughs> we won't yeah. go near HRT because that's another conversation. Yes. Um, down the front here. Sorry. Yes. Um, I've got probably two questions. Um, with with the fish, I think you might get a the, the large fish have a lot more mercury than the small fish, so that's a good sort of distinction. So the tuna is a large fish, sardines are small. Usually the predators have more. Um, question for Maggie is, where do we get um, fresh caught salmon as opposed to farmed uh, salmon? I knew this was coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the question for um, Professor Martins is, um, what do you think of the work of Dale Bredesen and uh, you know his theories with uh, even amyloid is actually a protective mechanism, uh, and it's it's where it's cleaved that really makes it. Uh, more toxic or less toxic? Can we start with that one and then we'll come to you. Could you just explain yes. what that means? Okay, so uh, basically uh, the, the beta amyloid as we know it is a very small protein. So if you think of insulin, it's about the size of insulin. But it comes as part of a much larger protein that we call the amyloid precursor protein. So that's their parent protein. And how it's cleaved determines whether you get beta amyloid or you preclude its formation. So estrogen and testosterone can direct that amyloid precursor protein in a good pathway, and you don't get any amyloid. So that's what he was referring to, and he's, he's taken our basic research and he's applied that. In terms of his approach, it's a very huge claims that have been made, so I'd be cautious, uh, uh, because I personally don't believe you can cure Alzheimer's disease once, you're fully, once it's fully clinically on. But there are some kinds of dementias that could be treated effectively. And so that needs, we need to pay attention to, to that. So as I said, I've been approached to, to take on some of the work that he's done, uh, as has probably other colleagues of ours in the field. And I said it's very important that somebody else independently is able to replicate his findings. And then we'd have confidence. Thank that you. Really has That's a question. 
and Maggie to the oh, farm. I've been waiting for this. So, uh, uh, and we're right. already halfway through uh, the book tour, and it's the first time it's come up, um, which surprised me. That was why I was talking to the CSIRO Fisheries, because I wanted um, um, a non emotive um, uh, um, information to be able to share. And there is no doubt. Um, farmed fish is the only way we will have fish in Australia at a price most people can afford. Um, and what the head of the CSIRO Fisheries said to me is the industry are being so reactive. The problem in Macquarie Harbour in Tasmania is a problem, but it is already so close to being fixed because industry and the CSIRO together jumped on it and uh, Macquarie Harbour is a particularly complex situation with three different um, uh, currents of water coming in. It's not a good place for the salmon to be. But they are working on it. They are working on it and they feel they have solutions. And there is one company that is only 10% of the farmed salmon that are, can categorically say no antibiotics. But the other bigger ones are very close to it. And they they want to be so, but they have to do it differently. So watch this space and once again go onto the website of the CSIRO. And it's happened because we have made brought attention to it. Mm. Um, no one wants to do it badly and we have to have farm fish because... And nobody wanted to destroy the businesses. No, no. Right. And the CSIRO don't want to destroy the businesses but they want it to be sustainable. Mm. So it is a work in progress and it is a serious work in progress. And it's still our most popular fish, isn't and, it? And it is because it's, it is the most affordable, accessible, fresh, we know it's coming in. Uh, and it's an oily fish. But um, that's why the mussels and the sardines are really important that we use these two because they are affordable as well. What about basa? Basa fish from the Mekong Delta? Uh, very, very cheap. Yes. Well, in <laughs> very, fact, very cheap. In fact, um, in fact there, there are fish that is available, but our Australian public don't want it. They all want flathead and King George whiting and blue-eyed cod. Um, and uh, so, you know, we public have a lot to do with this. But, yeah, watch this space. Well, I understand there are some locals having a go at Bassa because it yes. is a pretty yummy fish, but the Mekong Delta is the source at the moment. How are we doing here? We've got a, just a minute or two. Yes, sir? Just wait till the microphone comes, <laughs> if you would. Yeah, there have been many changes in health, and uh, Western society right throughout the world has a lot of indigestion. Now, as uh, a result of that, we have medications that affect uh, the acid uh, production, uh, proton uh, in inhibitors uh, including. And I'm just wondering, with the increase in Alzheimer's and uh, things like that. I'm wondering if medication and other changes that we have in health, have they maybe added to our absorption of nutrients? Ralph, is that one for you? Th that's a very good question. Yes, uh, yes. And we haven't looked at it yet. That's some of the things we are starting to look at uh, in this court that we've been f following. Because that's uh, the yeah. end of our lives when we tend to take more. No, a lot more and sometimes yeah. unnecessarily more. Yes. Uh, so that's, that's a huge factor. And we've known that sometimes doctors and people are getting quite ill, take them off their medication and their cognition improves. Uh, yes. We also know that anesthetics... So people, who, especially older people doing surgery, can have a huge negative impact. So, there's a, so we are actually now looking at that whole story in, the, in this <coughs> level of Australia that we've been following. But that's definitely a very important question. And I guess one of the things we haven't even mentioned very briefly is we're just living longer, aren't we? Uh, and that, and yes. yeah. So in terms of in terms of the overall story, I, I think that might be a contribution. Yes. But the fact that we're living longer, we can't deny the fact that the older we get, the higher the risk of dementia. So people are 85 years and older, we get almost half of them getting dementia. So that's one problem. The other problem is we're getting a lot of these chronic diseases a lot earlier. So, and this is where the lifestyle comes in. So type 2 diabetes was a disease for middle age. We're now seeing it in 13-year-olds and teenagers. So, and that's impacting. Type 2 diabetes is a major risk factor for Alzheimer's. So it's lifestyle and living longer, having, it's a combination of these factors. We've got time for one more, yes. 
Just wait for your mic if you would. Thank you. Just, just wait a second if you would so we can all hear. Thank you. Um, just a very quick one. I um, would like to hear your views on fish oil tablets. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people here would be taking one or two or more every day. So it should be you, Ralph. Uh, Ralph, yes. So, so we, we definitely know that if we give omega-3, particularly in animal studies, we see a profound effect on lowering amyloid in the brain. So there's lots and lots of animal studies being done. For Alzheimer's, there's no definitive study be done to date. So I can't give you a clear answer today, but I'll tell you this. We are now doing a, a clinical trial. We're looking at testosterone because we know testosterone lowers amyloid in the brain. And we're looking at uh, omega-3 DHA. And together, uh, we hope that we could have a much more profound effect. And there's but, also the effect, isn't there, on heart disease and on arthritis. And that's been demonstrated yes. for heart disease. Yes. But the, the capsules... We are uncertain of because, and there's a whole vari variability on the difference of where they got from, and and, and also how. I mean, we talked about fresh food, so sometimes you see capsules being sold off very readily at a reduced price. How old are they? How long have they been lying around? And can you believe the label? Label exactly, yes, yes. exactly. Eat so the if, fish. It's, if it's oxo, eat, eat the, the fish. fish. Eat the fish. Eat the fish. There we go, folks. Thank you very much. We have reached our time, and that's been uh, just wonderful. Would you please thank Maggie Beer? And Professor Ralph Martin. This is not a diet book. <laughs> and thank you for your questions. They were just great. Um, there will be more signings, Which, by the way. Yeah. Oh, I think we have a final word. That's right. um, outside the door, just on your way out. If so, you would just wait a moment, there's yeah. a brief farewell. Yeah, so just, well, farewell. Thank you very much indeed. That was terrific. I was listening with uh, particularly close attention as somebody who grew up in the 1960s in England on a diet of instant mashed potato, canned <laughs> vegetables, and that horrible dessert called Angel's Delight. Anybody remember that? Horrible <laughs> stuff. But I've been married to a Japanese person for 26 years, so I'm oh, hoping that's you'll quite be right then. I'll be okay. <laughs> um, Look, I, I'm not a scientist. I do know a bit about public policy and its effectiveness, though. And one thing I know is that you have to make a message fun and compelling to get it over. And uh, I think our guests tonight have really done that. That was absolutely wonderful, terrific. And uh, special thanks to Maggie, who's fighting a, a cold, I know. So thanks for turning up and doing this. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.